Hello everyone, welcome to UMD Media's weekly H panel. H panel starts now. We are live with H panel on YouTube and Facebook. Those who are following us on both platforms, please share, like, subscribe, uh, so that uh, many can access this material. This panel is a weekly program here at UMD Media. UMD Media works on understanding, measuring, and doing. And it tries to contribute for evidence-led, evidence-rich discourse and decision-making in the Horn of Africa, the H panel starts now. Okay, uh, gentlemen, again, welcome back to the weekly H panel, the Horn panel. It's always a great pleasure to have you here for your insight on what has been going on in the Horn of Africa, zooming in into Ethiopia. So today we selected this topic, the uh, small window uh, in the war, what, when, and how. The starting point for this was the um, uh, high representative for the African Union to so the Horn of Africa uh, of Asanjo. He made this uh, recently at the UN Security Council. Let me uh, play that and we will go to our Friday to Friday highlights. Leaders here in Addis Ababa and in the North agree individually that the difference between them are political and require political solution through dialogue. They therefore constitutes a window of opportunity. It is, however, important to mention the window of opportunity we have is very little <coughs> and that the time is short for any intervention in this regard. So this is the starting point. Then the U.S. Uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary of State and others were talking about this window, small window, closing soon, and so on. So that's the topic we'll be discussing. But before that, what were the um, highlight, the big ticket items uh, for you guys uh, since we met last Friday? Uh, we want to start. Faisal, you want to start with that? You are muted, uh, Faisal. Thank you very much, Ketacho, and uh, welcome uh, my colleagues. I think it, the big issue that stood up this week was the one that you very much mentioned. Uh, so we'll come back to that. What uh, also uh, stood for me uh, is all the diplomatic uh, shuttle diplomacy that's going on in Ethiopia from the US to uh, EU to the 11 uh, different delegations that came to Addis, uh, as well as uh, Jeffrey Feltman's uh, mission back and forth, uh, and uh, his prior uh, presentation at the United States Institute for Peace, where he really laid down the foundation for what he would like to do despite his limited knowledge about the Horn of Africa and, you know, without undermining his expertise in the Middle East and Afghanistan, Iraq and what have you. I think that stood up for me. Uh, and then what, what stood up for me this particular week is some issues that I like to focus, which were internal. 
uh, some of the developments that took place in the Somali region stood up for me. One item that stood up very clearly is the child soldier uh, development uh, that's taking place in the Somali region. As you know, Getacho, uh, yes, thank you very much. There are uh, confirmed reports that uh, children as young as 14 have been assembled, as you can see from their picture in a campus that uh, Mustafa Omar and his government is saying they will train. That stood up for me, and I will come back. The arrest of uh, Filson Abdi's father, Filson Abdi is a former immediate uh, minister in the previous uh, government of uh, Mr. Rabi, who resigned her position, who also, uh, upon visit uh, to Makale last year, uh, voiced her concern and disagreement with the government in terms of the massive rape that took place in that, uh, in that area. Uh, so I will leave it here and leave to my friends uh, for the rest. But I think, uh, you know, the uh, Getacho read us uh, uh, tech this morning about the uh, well, how he reads the coming of the coalition, uh, particularly following the Washington meeting of the nine group and how TDFT PLFCs and how TDFT PLFCs its relationship with Ola. Uh, which I thought was very comprehensive the way he explained what is written, what's not written, whether the strategy is worked out for the two for the group is, is still you know finished or a beginning. That was very interesting and that stood up for me and then uh, I will leave it here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, Professor Eskel. I think for me what's to now is uh the current wave uh, of arrests of Tigrayans uh, across the country. Ten days ago, um, the Tigray Defense Forces uh, captured, took control of two strategic towns in the Amhara region. That made it clear uh, to the Ethiopian government that uh, the Tigrayan uh, forces and the Tigray government um, were serious about breaking the siege. Breaking the siege, if you want to interpret it, that would mean maybe taking over the uh, um, artery that connects Addis Ababa with uh, Djibouti, could be interpreted uh, uh, as such. Could it simply mean that take control of uh, Addis, remove the authorities there, and then that will break the siege? So militarily speaking, Looking at it from a strategic point of view, the movement uh, to me seemed like a pincer movement, closing in uh, on Addis Ababa uh, by forces uh, uh, aligned with the Tigrayans, uh, the, the Oromo Liberation Army and the others, including the Ago uh, Liberation uh, Front. That s signals to Addis that that uh, Addis Ababa is now the target after uh, the fall of Desi and uh, Kambocha. And there seem to be, uh, from a military standpoint, there seem to be only a couple of strategic spots uh, where Ethiopia could uh, uh, draw the line and, and try to defend uh, Addis Ababa and the prosperity power center from the TDF juggernaut. The response uh, to that signal from the Ethiopian government was to, state, uh, to declare a state of emergency. And under, under that state of emergency, all opponents will be dragged net, uh, will be taken the drag net, rounded up, and, uh, and maybe charged or simply put in concentration camps as the sycophants of the uh, Prosperity Party were demanding last week. So to uh, this week, what stands out for me is the fact that um, across the entire country, not just in, in, in uh, the capital, that Tigrayans and uh, many Oromos uh, uh, are being rounded up uh, almost randomly. They're being fired from their jobs. They're being jailed. Um, uh, searches go from house to house by European security forces. Uh, um, 
and all kinds of uh, concentration camps were uh, opened. So that stands out for me uh, because that also indicates the state of uh, play as far as the war is concerned, that the Ethiopian government has now resorted to taking innocent people off the street from their houses, from their work, and then uh, maybe hold them as a bargaining chip, that the pressure is on, the military onslaught is clear, so it, the government of Ethiopia has re resorted, resorted to simply um, rounding up uh, um, innocent people. So that is basically what stands out for me. I don't understand why every Tigrayan or ethnic, uh, ethnically motivated um, rounding up of people would do to change the, the course of uh, the war. I don't know if uh, intelligence, for instance, ordinary people, because that's what the American the Ethiopian government uh, suggested that they were uh, 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 intelligence workers, spies for that. Every Tigran was a spy for the TDF and explained it from a military point, point of view that they were denying the Tigran Defense Force any information that they might use to um, engage the Ethiopian military. I can't see, I can't see how children the elderly uh, could be accused of that kind of undertaking. It looks to me that uh, it's a desperate measure that the Ethiopian government, the government of 110 million people, is now resorted to sabotage uh, and an act that might be considered uh, war war crimes. So that's what really stands out for me. And the activity, this flurry of activities from the international arena, is also uh, related uh, to this state of play. Thank you, uh, Professor Skell. Uh, in addition to the uh, rounding and uh, detention of uh, <clears throat> ethnic Tigray and Oromos, we have seen in some cities like Bahardar, just uh, killing in the open air uh, of people like uh, this professor is the uh, professor uh, from Bahardar University who served the university until he retired recently, and uh, he chose to continue to serve, you know, serve in the university, but he was killed. And uh, even his burial was not uh, done uh, in the presence of his families who live in the same city. So this kind of extrajudicial killings are happening as we speak. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, Yosef, uh, what stood out for you uh, during the past week? Uh... Well, to uh, say a little bit uh, on what uh, uh, Professor Heskel has been saying, uh, to me, you know, uh, when I looked at uh, what's going on in Addis Ababa uh, uh, and other parts of Ethiopia where the government controls, uh, it's a continuation of the genocide in Said Tigray. Now the genocide has gone outward. Uh, it's happening somewhere else, I mean, where, uh, in the place where they, uh, where they control. Uh, we could almost call it a pogrom, you know, uh, if uh, uh, which is of course uh, an organized massacre. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, you know. So, but uh, the thing is this, you know, the uh, people, I mean, the West especially, have been always uh, wary of uh, calling, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, uh, the Abbey government, you know, uh, for genocide. Precisely because they always thought he was uh, reformable, uh, that he was not as bad as uh, others make him to be, uh, that he is in the position that he is now precisely because of Isaias or uh, the Amhara extremists. But a genocider is always a genocider, even on the last days of his uh, uh, of his government. Eh? Uh, he's doing what uh, uh, all the all genociders do. Genociders, you can only stop them. You cannot compromise with them. You cannot negotiate with them. You can only stop them. But you could st still see that even in the last days, you know, even when the rebels are at the gates of Addis Ababa, that uh, he's doing uh, uh, his genocidal task until the end. Anyway, let me uh, go back to. Uh, uh, your question. I, uh, there are two events that took place today, 
uh, that were uh, uh, that stood out for me. The one is uh, uh, what came out in the Washington Post article uh, today. Uh, it's pro probably the opposite of what Obasanjo uh, uh, Obasanjo is proposing. So I'm not going into that, but. Uh, He's calling, he's calling for action, you know, when the rebels are at the gates of Addis again. Uh, you could see that the Western world is in a panic mode. Huh? And in all of them, it seems that the narrative that they are buying is that uh, the capture of Addis Ababa as a big destabilizing event. In the as if uh, the presence of the uh, of the presence of the Abi government right now uh, in Addis Ababa uh, is a stabilizing factor. Now, uh, after enumerating various advantages that I mean various disadvantages of what is happening now in Ethiopia, uh, I think he was uh, the the guy who wrote this opinion was once a commander of NATO. He said that. Uh, uh, he proposed for U.S. boots on the ground, uh, as part of, of course, as part of the UN peace, peacekeeping force. If you remember last time, I mentioned this phenomenon, although I discounted it in the end. I said at that time that uh, if at the, uh, if the, uh, if a moment comes where the Abiy government is in total despair, the last thing that it could resort to is to call for UN peacekeeping force to come in between them and the TDF. Literally, it would work as a, uh, as a buffer zone, it means. Uh, but this one, of course, uh, will see uh, uh, that it could only lead to an Afghan-like paralysis uh, uh, if this thing happens. Huh? Uh, I doubt that it will happen because of the delusions of Abi himself. Uh, if you remember, the, uh, I mean, I, was it two days ago that he talked about uh, Mengistu Haile Mariam and uh, 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 the thing that he said was that uh, uh, so he was not defeated by TDF and, of course, uh, EPLF too. Uh, I mean, if, uh, TPLF and EPLF, but that he was uh, defeated by uh, propaganda. Mm? So that was that uh, what he said. Uh, and he, uh, interestingly enough, he even told us a parameter. He said that within 200 kilometers of parameter from Addis Ababa, there hasn't been, uh, at that time, no war was, no battle was conducted. So uh, what he is saying that more or less that he, they could defeat them, even if the uh, TDF, uh, Ola and the others reach within that two, uh, two, uh, 200 kilometers parameter. That gives us uh, a window to his uh, delusional mind. Another one, uh, another event that also happened today is the sanctions imposed on Eritrea. Again, uh, they came up with an impressive list of the uh, entities that America wants to sanction. Huh? Uh, but I am wary of this one because for two reasons. First of all, despite mentioning about six entities there. Uh, Eritrea works like the Russian doll. If you take the, uh, the big doll uh, uh, outside, then you find a smaller door inside. And then if you take that out, then you find another one inside. You could have, I mean, a number of dolls within one doll. In this case, for example, uh, let me mention uh, the, the, the entities that have been uh, uh, not the, the people, but the entities that have been put, uh, uh, that the U.S. put sanctions on. Uh, the Red Sea uh, Trading Corporation, for example, it's a big trading corporation that monopolizes almost all internal and outside uh, trade in Eritrea. Uh, all import and export is read, and since it gets also all the uh, hard currency, uh, literally, uh, th there is no private company that can compete with it. Now, this Red Sea Corporation is owned by Hedri Trust, another, another one that has been uh, uh, sanctioned by uh, the U.S. Now, this Hedri Trust is it's a holding company for all PFDJ businesses and enterprises, to mention few of them. Red Sea Trade Corp Corporation is one of them, of course, uh, Housing and Commerce Bank, Red Sea uh, bottles, that is Coca-Cola, 
the second construction company and almost all construction companies in each, in Eritrea. Uh, the uh, wine and liquor company, the Melotti beer company, you almost everything that uh, that in Eritrea factories, farms, uh, and businesses are being owned by Hedri Trust. So you could see Hedri Trust owning the uh, Red Sea uh, Red Sea Corporation company, and who owns Hedri Trust? Uh, PFDJ. So you have the other door, the bigger door coming as the PFDJ itself. That is the, uh, the party itself, which is the uh, uh, People's Front for uh, Democracy and Justice. Huh? Uh, it couldn't get more Orwellian than that. That is what, uh, uh, which owns almost everything in Eritrea. Now, who owns the PFDJ? Of course, the, uh, the, 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 the government, uh, which is uh, Isaias and uh, 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 the, the people mentioned is there like Hagos uh, Gabrahiwat and the other guy is, I believe, uh, Abraha Kasa. So what I'm trying to say is if the U.S. had only sanctioned PFDJ, then it comes down to having sanctioned all of this. Even EDF, the, the other one that it has been sanctioned, it comes under that. One of the reasons why it's, it seems to be uh, to doing a lot, but it's also doing little. Uh, another another thing is that all of these companies, uh, uh, the sanctions block only uh, property uh, is owned in the USA. So it has to have connection with the USA. None of these companies have any connection with the USA. That means, again, its effectiveness will be minimal. So despite all this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, when you look at it, it seems impressive, but when you go to the details of it, it had little, it would have little effect on the, uh, in the Elysian case. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Josef. Uh, Faisal, you wanna interject? No, I, I just uh, probably will go back to some of the issues, uh, but I think the U.S., from what I understand and what I'm privy to, it has prepared layers and layers of uh, sanctions. So uh, maybe you know this would be one of the minimal sanctions to just uh, send a strong message, and then what would follow from there would be probably more uh, biting sanctions. So I don't think, as Yosef said, you're right. It might be you know a small at this point in time, but I would expect more to come as uh, SIS becomes defiant, including to a point where uh, Yosef and I were talking earlier, including addressing uh, and, and you know taking measures or conferring with some of the countries that SIS depends on, on, such as the United Arab Emirates, which is the main gate that he has at this point. I'll just say this is probably the, uh, the, the first uh, Lake. But if I just continue, uh, and I don't want to take more time, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, with the you know flurry of uh, Obasanjo uh, shuttle diplomacy and his comment to say, I just like to underscore the fact that as we speak today, the Tigray war is one year old, and that one year AU was uh, uh, am I missing in action? Not only were they missing in action, but they took sides. AU practically took side. And I will quote this. When the Mecca McConnell met in 2020, the vice chair of the AU, who comes from Congo, DRC, Felix Tashakeli, basically uh, the Mecca said that this is a war and law and order that we like to finish and we will bring this closer uh, anytime soon. And the junta would be crushed. Those are the words the Mecca Nakonin used it to the AU's uh, vice chair. The conversation went on, and the Congolese uh, uh, presidential office literally released a statement where it said that we are with Ethiopia and with the government of Ethiopia because we will help Ethiopia to take its country back the way Ethiopia took Gambella and Asosa back in the Second World War. This is AU's leaders 
who are basically encouraging the Ethiopian government to continue a civil war and purge an ethnic group within the country. That's why I don't expect anything that Obasanja says to bear any fruits. I think TDF and Ola know very well that EU, AU has taken a role, a very discernible role in this war. And for him to say that the window is closing, the way I would like to read is that he probably says, I cannot do anything given the conditions that both sides is laid down, particularly Tikrai's conditions, the six conditions, as well as Abiy's conditions, which says I'm the king and I want them to recognize me. So of course the windows, the windows are closing. And I think the peacemaking at the AU or by the AU has been lost long time ago. And uh, with that, I just say that um, Obasanjo is playing with words. He probably knows that everything is a done deal at this point in time. And I will not uh, remiss my words to say that uh, peace process should have started right in November last year. And AU's leadership should not have spoken this word. The very fact that they spoke this word is makes Tikrai and Ola and other Ethiopians who are struggling for their rights like a non existent entity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Sgail, uh, I want to play what uh, Secretary Blinken uh, spoke today in uh, Qatar uh, regarding the uh, Ethiopia. Uh, situation so well, finally e ethiopia um i am very concerned uh about the potential for uh, ethiopia to uh to implode uh given uh what we're um, what we're seeing uh both in tigray uh but also as uh we have different forces and different ethnic groups uh, that are increasingly uh, at odds. And we are working very closely to uh, support the efforts of the former Nigerian president, Obasanjo, to mediate uh, a way forward uh, with all the Ethiopian parties. We're in extremely uh, regular and close contact with him. We have a special envoy, uh, Ambassador Jeff Feltman, uh, who is uh, deeply engaged in this. Other uh, key players in the region um, are very much engaged. And I think as each of the different groups uh, is looking at this, um, there, are, there are two paths forward. One path forward is uh, out and out conflict, which could lead to the implosion of Ethiopia and spill over into uh, other countries in the region. And that would be disastrous for the Ethiopian people uh, and uh, also for, uh, for countries uh, in the region. Uh, the other path is uh, to halt all of the um, military actions that are, uh, that are currently underway, to sit down, uh, to negotiate a, uh, a real ceasefire, uh, to make sure that humanitarian assistance can get in. So uh, maybe on this topic of uh, small window, window closing and so on, do you see um, that the US may be seeing uh, there is a need to salvage Abiy? Uh, vis-a-vis -vis this, um, the potential for implosion, or do you see, they would see their forces, TDF, Ola, and others uh, being um, forces to consider, you know, seriously in terms of uh, widening whatever window they are talking about. So you can speak to that and uh, expand on what has been said uh, so far. So I think the US has been talking about impollution in Ethiopia not at the government level, but at policy think tanks and at academia level in the last two years. You recall the United States Institute for Peace, where five ambassadors who all worked in Ethiopia were assembled in 2019, I believe June 2019, including Sheen and what have you, where they literally talked about a potential civil war, a potential breakup of the country, and potential disintegration, even the Yugoslavia syndrome and was mentioned by this high caliber ambassadors. So in the diplomatic circles of Washington, this issue has been there. I think when 
Ola and TDF finally smelled the, the victory for their hard work, the US government diplomatically wants things to happen in the most, in the least impacting way. Abi is, as I said, in many occasions is taking a disabled for hostage because most of the country is either Tikra is liberated by, by TDF, so is uh, some significant portion is of Amara region. Afar is almost falling into the hands of TDF in the coming few days if the information we are getting is right. So is in Oromia, which literally from Negele, part of that area, all the way to the outskirts of uh, uh, the South, South Shawa, have fallen into the hands of uh, Ola in, in big ways. Basically, the US would like the best scenario. The best scenario would have been for the US, this thing to come down to a closure through negotiation and settlement. However, they are not ignorant of the fact that perhaps, and I'm underlining the word perhaps, perhaps they understand that, that line has been crossed a long time ago. They have been watching this war for a long time. They have been assessing and analyzing. I am not really naive to say that they don't understand where TDF and all I stand, given also uh, the fact that they created alliance with other groupies. I think what the U.S. is expressing and uh, the secretary expressed correctly is how Abi would like to play the card so that he meddles everything. And the card Abi would like to play is to create a scenario where Addis Ababa becomes the past scenario we have seen in Mogadishu, bloodbath where different groups uh, fight. But when I look at the discipline of TDF and Ola so far, and how they have been handling the areas that they have been liberating, if you will. I am under in the impression that not that much uh, of the scenario, the impolution that uh, is uh, expressed by the secretary would happen in the case of Ethiopia. Great, thank you, Faisal. Professor Ritzkel? I am surprised. To be honest, I am surprised that the Secretary of State of the United States actually used that word, that the Ethiopian state is in the risk of implosion, that he used that, that term. Uh, Jeffrey Feldman's deputy, uh, I don't remember his name right now, but someone who seems to understand Ethiopian politics and politics in the Horn of Africa quite well, uh, compared Ethiopia to Yugoslavia. Uh, when he when the special envoy was appointed, in comparing the the, the two um, uh, uh, federations, he said that in the case of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia imploded. In Ethiopia, he said it's going to explode. What he meant is what happens in in the implosion that uh, might occur in Addis Ababa, or probably will occur in Addis Ababa is going to have repercussions uh, to, um, uh, for the whole region. So for the Secretary of State to state bluntly that they are concerned about Ethiopia um, at, risk, uh, at the risk of uh, uh, implosion is recognition of the fact. Probably what uh, Faisal said, that if these two forces uh, control Addis Ababa, the risk of implosion would be substituted by the removal of the prosperity party from, from power. But um, they do recognize, I think Americans and Europeans, they do recognize what might happen if there is a gap between the entry of the opposition to Addis Ababa uh, and the loss of uh, uh, authority in Addis Ababa by the prosperity party. I think that's what's basically they're seeing that the federal government is basically collapsing under the feet of Abiy Ahmed. In the speech that uh, uh, Yosef talked about earlier, if one scrutinizes for what the, the prime minister was saying, and knowing this prime minister, that he always speaks his mind, that is, he speaks, no wittingly or unwittingly, he, he 
uh, blurts out what's on his mind. That means that night or that day, he was thinking about Mengistu Hailamaryam escaping, and that is dawning on him. The reason that is dawning on him is that, his, that the federal government is basically uh, collapsing under his feet. So what he was trying to do then was that I'm not going to leave. Uh, so um, some of you have already started uh, escaping, and I know uh, three or four people who are elected to parliament from Oromia region uh, have already uh, fled. Uh, one is in Germany, one is in Canada. They've already fled. So it's trying to show up his, his, his government. But the United States and other observers of the European scene or the Horn of Africa scene understand quite well what's, what's, what's going on. And you could glean this from the speech that uh, of Olusego Navasanjo, the uh, AU envoy uh, for the Horn of Africa, and the UN political affairs chief, uh, Rosemary uh, De Carlo, uh, said when they briefed the United Nations uh, Security Council. The word that they used is not something uh, uh, that I expect the diplomats, uh, seasoned diplomats, to use. De Carlo said that that Ethiopia is descending, or the risk of Ethiopia descending into a widening civil war is only too real. I've never heard an uh, uh, um, international uh, organization employee speak in those terms, in those stark uh, clear and undiplomatic, and diplomatic in the sense that it is so uh, uh, clear. And the the AU envoy, the former Nigerian pres uh, president, Olusego Nabasanjo, at the same meeting, he said that the leaders in Addis Ababa and in Tigray uh, all understand or agree individually. That's that's important. They all agree that individually there are differences. The, the differences between them, like if the North in Addis uh, is political and that there is no military solution to a political problem. That's what they realize. That's what they realize. That's what they understand. But his conclusion was too uh, that the window of opportunity, which is what we, we have used today, uh, the opportunity that we have is, number one, he said, very little. Very little opportunity. And the time is short. Interpret that, it means that there is no negotiated settlement. That's basically what it really means. They, if they don't, if the opportunity that they have is too little or very little, and if the time is too short, that simply means there is no possibility. And of course, when you see the gap between the two, the gap that they stated as their uh, uh, conditions for negotiations, if you see the gap, it's un unbridgeable. Uh, for that, I'll take my cues only from the interview that uh, General Saad uh, uh, gave a couple of days ago, or three or four days ago, in which he also said that negotiated settlement is not possible. The reason that there is no negotiating partner. He said the war is going to be over. It's probably over already. There will be some... Uh, uh, battles and mop-up uh, activities that will happen, but the war is over, and when the war is over, there will be no opponent to negotiate with. To that, he added something important, that he said that the Ethiopian government has basically fallen under uh, the Eritrean government, that the security uh, apparatus in Addis Ababa is manned by Eritrean security personnel, and more importantly, uh, the banks, uh, the banks, uh, the foreign exchange uh, sector in particular, is entirely controlled by the Eritreans. The implication of that is, to me, what the, what the general is saying is that Ethiopia is basically under occupation, under Eritrean occupation. That Ethiopians must realize that this government is basically uh, uh, a, a poodle of the uh, Isaias Afwerki, Ethiopia is basically a, a colony of Isaias, that it must be liberated. So, when you look at what the Ethiopian government is saying, of course, they have moved to saying that if the uh, two or three things are fulfilled, they might be negotiating. Uh, and what they're asking is that the Tigrayans, the Grand Forces withdraw uh, to Tigray. 
that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Tigray is not going to withdraw. Tigray is not going to retreat. Tigray forces are not going to disarm. That's not going to happen. On the other hand, the Tigray, people, uh, the Tigray uh, government is asking or requiring as a precondition, uh, putting as a precondition that, uh, of course, ostensibly they say the breaking of the siege, which is understandable, but they're also demanding the establishment of uh, a transitional government, which simply means that the prosperity government is no longer going to be there. So how do you bridge this gap? So the war uh, is going to be concluded by a victory of one side or the other, um, and, and, and international um, organizations, governments also understand that there is absolutely uh, no opportunity for a negotiated uh, settlement. That's basically what I understood about the speeches and uh, and um, uh, comments by uh, officials uh, 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 of the United States and the United Nations. Mm. Mm. Thank you, uh, Professor Skell. Yosef, uh, you will comment on this uh, question. I, I just want to add, uh, how possible is it, because we are getting information that uh, Abi behind the scene is uh, even talking to the US on saving himself from Isaiah Safworki. Um, so this uh, is coming out uh, and he's even uh, once he gets a recognition from TDF, as he uh, mentioned it in uh, through Dina Mufti, I can uh, play that uh, just for a sec. Bongis Vokulalo Flagut, Basalam and Nagar Muftaf, no Nagargan, in Salam La Salam Lutin Organist Felga, Lila Ogan, Matavara Libet, Yas Lalta Geneno, Enagar Yalcatello. In a in the Salam is a Baba Kul in a Burung Kurtanet, Nasra Duacho. Amin the Salama Dridur as for Lagio Nagaruchin Dalum Sale the Samoa Dridur in the match, a Kazacho Yamaranai Farkluch, a good motor in Dalabet, Yazin Mangus Gavinet Macaval in Dalabet. Gatum a government no best with America among the Stimaka visitors attaching to Latin Mutas. Yeah, so he's basically asking for recognition from uh, TDF, and uh, so but the information we are getting is, if he gets this recognition and if they pull out all that, he would be willing after the country is stable, he would be willing to uh, to establish a transitional government. So you can comment on that as well, uh, but building on what uh, has been said. Uh, all right. Before. Okay. Okay, let me start with the, uh, with the gap that uh, uh, Professor Hesgel has been uh, talking about. Uh, uh, only on its structural side, uh, because uh, uh, the rest has already been said by uh, both the panelists. Uh, there is always this point, you know, about uh, uh, stopping the offensive, which is one of the uh, requirements, uh, preconditions of Abyss government. The first one was to, uh, for TDF to stop its offensive. Uh, the second one being to withdraw from the Amhara and uh, Afar. And the third one to recognize the federal government, uh, the one that you have been uh, talking about. Uh, if you look at it, stopping uh, to stop its offensive, this has been said before uh, uh, in different words, of course, uh, uh, by many other uh, uh, players. Uh, for example, the ones that he have shown as the Blinken, he calls it to halt the offensive. Uh, so Ma Samantha Powers uh, even went further. Uh, not only did she ask to stop the offensive, she also asked for the uh, TDF to uh, uh, withdraw from uh, Afar and Amhara. Now, why is it not possible for uh, uh, for uh, TDF to stop its offensive. Uh, I'm looking now uh, from the procedural point of view. One of the many reasons uh, uh, why the TDF doesn't want to stop the offensive is uh, because the asymmetrical nature of the war. That's by asymmetrical, I mean, uh, for example, Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government has its own resources uh, it gets all its arms, its ammunition, uh, and what, uh, whatever else that it gets uh, to fight the war uh, from the outside world. 
But TDF, it gets all its, uh, its supply, its uh, uh, ammunition supply and uh, uh, armaments from the enemy. If that is the case, then the, uh, the, uh, the TDF cannot fight a defensive war. It cannot dig like uh, the Eritreans are doing right now. It cannot dig trenches and wait for the enemies to come because it will soon uh, uh, run out of, the, of, of, of ammunition. One of the main things that, that propels this war, uh, it always comes in one offensive after another, is precisely because uh, the nature of this, asym this asymmetrical nature of the war. Now, not only does it get all its ammunition from the enemy, yeah, it has also to arm uh, tens, the tens of thousands of soldiers uh, that it keeps uh, training in, uh, in Tigray. They will have to get their rifles. They will have to get their uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, the, the dishkas and all other uh, kind of armaments from the from the enemy. So it's structured in such a way that it could only end. Uh, it could only end when it comes to its logical end, which means either it will have to defeat the enemy or it will have to be defeated. There, there is no way it can uh, it can stop its offensive. The second one is similarly uh, uh, it's the reorganization of the uh, of the of the enemy it cannot allow the enemy to get reorganized because the, uh, the enemy it has all the resources and all the population to get reorganized and come back at it so there is also some kind of probably a, a kind of a mathematical model to this the, uh, the, 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 the TDF has been demolishing the army at a faster rate uh, than the time it would take for the for the enemy for, for the Ethiopian enemy yeah, to reorganize itself. So it's a game in between the two. It has to be done faster than the other, or else, if there is a gap in time, it will be to the advantage of Ethiopia because it could use its resources and its population to get back the balance to where it was before. So once this balance is offset, the, 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 the TDF has to do that constantly again until its logical end. There is also a third one, and that has also to do with the time, with timing itself. TDF, I mentioned that one last time, TDF is, right, is not only uh, uh, trying to defeat the enemy, but to defeat the enemy on time, on a deadline it has set itself. I use the metaphor of a ticking bomb that the enemies, namely Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Amahara, have left in Tigray. So they are, they are running against that. I mean, the, uh, the race is to defuse uh, uh, that humanitarian bomb from exploding, priority is exploding. So for all these reasons, TDF has to go on the offensive constantly. And that is probably uh, either knowingly or unknowingly, uh, the West keeps uh, the West keeps uh, misunderstanding. Now, as to the withdrawal from the Afar, from the Amhara and the Afar, uh, uh, you have seen it. Uh, 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 there is no, I mean, there is no counter offer. You know, uh, if there had been, for example, if they, if uh, the Abiy government had offered uh, uh, Tigray. Uh, uh, to I mean to withdraw from West Tigray, then at least it would make sense. But that also uh, doesn't hold true. So uh, the last one I believe is uh, uh, to recognize the Abiy government, but that also sounds a bit oxymor oxymoronic because isn't what isn't that what the war is all about? Uh, uh, it's about uh, each considering the other illegitimate. If that is the case, then probably negotiations do, what negotiations do is how to make this, this two compromise. I mean, uh, if that is possible, I don't think that's possible. Uh, uh, but it seems to me that uh, uh, Abi is trying to get uh, uh, things that he couldn't get through, through uh, the battlefield uh, by some kind of uh, semantic trickery. But to the last question that he have come, uh, that he is trying to uh, uh, somehow uh, 
uh, dump uh, Isaias uh, and create uh, a transition government. Uh, that to me, that to me, seems to me odd because isn't the transition government that is all about, you know, transition government, which he is not part of. That is the whole issue. The underlining the transition government is that TDF, Ola, and the others are uh, uh, demanding is a transition government that the Abi government is not part of. But if he is uh, dreaming of a transition government, uh, uh, which is part, which he directs, then uh, it doesn't work. So I'm not sure whether uh, the, the, the things that you are saying, you know, the, the things that you are alluding, that uh, 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 is, uh, that is trying to dump Isaias, and as a result uh, wants to get to have a, a window out of this, is. Uh, to, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how uh, how that will uh, play out. Uh, last, uh, just one sentence. Uh, Faisal said before about about the sanction of Eritrea that it's kind of this is the beginning of other as uh, other sanctions to come. But the problem is this incremental sanctions uh, don't work precisely because uh, that there is no time. Uh, they, they are always uh, the problem with the sanctions that uh, the U.S. is even now conducting is uh, uh, it didn't come on time. Had it begun, for example, six months or seven months ago, then we could make sense of how the incremental sanctions would work. But right now, for example, it would make sense if they had an arms embargo, right an embargo, because there is no time at all. Uh, so. The, I believe the West has always been getting its timing wrong, and the sanctions that the U.S. is doing is part of that. Mm. Great, thank you, Yosef. Uh, gentlemen, about the uh, you know Abi putting forward conditions for negotiation, all that. Uh, but in Ethiopia, as as far as we know, the pro Abi media the elite, everyone is not talking about negotiation. Actually, they have been very strongly advocating for yeah. no negotiation at all, uh, including, you know, when this uh, famous artist, I'm just playing the, what happened last week. This is a pro-war uh, rally at the largest uh, square uh, of the country at Mascala Square. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I think this is a wrong video, but uh, he was about to sing, but then he said, you know, this is not the time for singing and for, uh, you know, uh, taking, sending the youth to the war enough is enough and he said you know instead of sending the youth to the war front what we have to send is the elders and uh, you know solve this peacefully but after that he within hours he was forced to apologize for saying that uh uh in his words he could get, he get uh, he got a lot of uh, death threats and other uh, you know uh scary uh, message from uh, pro-government, pro-Avi uh, forces. So, but Avi is through Dina Mufti, as we heard before, is putting forward conditions and behind the scene, we know also what he's putting forward. So you, you can comment on, on that, uh, Professor Skelly may start now and uh, also give us your final word for this week. You are uh, muted. I, I should, yeah, now you got it. I think even the video that you showed, it was supposed to be a war rally in support of the war, a rally in support of the war. But one of the persons that was selected uh, to denounce the junta and, um, and uh, rouse uh, uh, the, the spectators there has uh, turned out to be um, a pacifist who, who was at war, but a pacifist to speak. That even tells me that uh, 
the, the support, the public support for the war is waning. Um, what I heard about that event is that, uh, you know, in, in, in Ethiopia and different places, uh, there is a long line. Uh, one of the things that I surpri surprised me about three, two years ago when I was there is that people actually line up to wait for this uh, shuttle buses. And, and um, the security forces were coming in and telling people to get into the buses and then get, brought them to the, to the Mescal Square for the rally. That's how they filled the section that, uh, that they filled. Uh, look, uh, this is not going to, uh, the war is not going to be sustained by, uh, by, by propaganda or uh, outright lie or simply throwing human flesh at uh, the Tigrayan defense forces. Uh, the Ethiopian side is also going to be exhausted. Uh, there is no uh, revenue uh, that is uh, sufficient to finance this war, even if they want to buy more weapons, which, by the way, if they want to prolong the war, um, they could buy and uh, purchase more, more weapons, and if they engage the Tigrayans, the Tigrayans will keep getting it uh, from them. So I think... General Sarkhan is right that the war is over. What we don't have right now is not that the war could continue indefinitely. It is a vision for the post Abbey uh, uh, dispensation that neither the OLA nor uh, the TTLF had put out a road map, a road map that would get us from where we are today from a civil war, from a brutal war, to a political settlement. The gap is not really, when, and not only the wide between the TPS, T TDF and the Ethiopian government or its uh, allies, the gap is in the vision of the country. At least 30 years ago, multinational federation was uh, accepted as a modality in which the country of Ethiopia could stay together with the nations and nationalities exercising self-rule. Self I don't think that formula itself could be salvaged this time. Can't ask that of uh, the Tigrayans. I can't ask that of uh, many Oromos. I can't ask that of, of, of Somalis. Uh, so a political, a new social compact is going to be uh, necessary. But to get there, uh, the war must end. The ne negotiations, the Ethiopian government had been inching towards the negotiated settlement. I have information, some information that uh, Abi himself do, does want to negotiate, but his Amhara allies do not. And Amhara allies are not able to support Abi to accept negotiated settlement because the warlords that are supporting them uh, the warlords that actually started the war in uh, Western Tigray for um, uh, Sesme, for the Sesme uh, uh, cultivation, um, they're not going to allow them. So the Amhara region, which is the uh, more adamant than other regions to continue the war, is not under under a solid control. Even the new president has no support in the Amhara region. The Amhara region is basically uh, now uh, controlled by warlords. So it's going to be very difficult to put uh, a coalition in Ethiopia together to uh, to support Abiy's venture to negotiate uh, end this war through negotiations. It is the back the supporters. It is what stands behind Abiy that is um, uh, going to encumber him from uh, uh, negotiated settlement. So this man is really a prisoner who cannot get his own way. Um, at some at some point, it looks like if he's get, getting to get, get tired of uh, all of this being pulled left and right, he might abscond. I'm hearing you. You're muted, together. I'm sorry. Um, th thank you very much for that. Uh, I was trying to get uh, what was what came out this week as well in terms of the economy. You, you were talking about the war economy. Uh, so this is, um, uh, again, yet another uh, another uh, downgrading 
of the uh, prospects of the economy. So last time um, there was this, uh, it was at CCC plus, and now it's went even into more uh, junker, junkier, I would say. So this is um, a country that normally is having uh, millions of people and the safety net, including in Tigray and elsewhere. Uh, but the economy is uh, going uh, down spiral uh, and nobody in the elite is seeing this uh, as a problem. So final word, uh, Yosef. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, uh, what comes to my, uh, to my mind is precisely because there has been this uh, uh, ongoing war uh, on the mill front, huh? uh, and uh, uh, it has been uh, a little bit longer than we have expected. Uh, but there is a reason why uh, many of us are looking to the mill front, because uh, if uh, the TDF captures mill, then uh, it would chalk huh? uh, as a lifeline uh, that uh, of, of Addis Ababa. It's precisely, this is precisely because Addis Ababa uh, uh, is uh, uh, a city uh, that, uh, that only responds uh, to its pain only, not to the pain of other cities or the other part, I mean, the, uh, at least the other parts of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, but uh, to, for example, you know, the fact that Abi uh, has not only cut off uh, services to Tigray, but also to Wollo, uh, to the heartland of Amhara, uh, uh, which he calls the Dejen, you know. Uh, it shows us that they don't give a damn so far uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as the war logic dictates it. So at this, that's why we feel that Mille is central uh, to uh, bringing uh, the Ataba regime down. But I have also, also an additional idea because uh, it has been taken, uh, we always talk about the toll uh, that the government is taking, but we at the same time, uh, of course, don't talk about the toll it takes to uh, the people that are fighting, for example, the TDF, the OLA, and, uh, and all the rest. Now, uh, at one time, uh, I remember uh, it was uh, uh, with you, I believe, uh, uh, we talked about how uh, Abi eh, has shown how to fight the 21st century war. Whether we like it or not, he has shown us how to fight the 21st century war because f sitting from Addis Ababa, eh, he could switch on and off eh, an entire uh, an entire region. That was not possible 30 years ago or 40 years ago uh, because of the technology, because of the advancement of the technology. Now he could sit at it, he could, uh, uh, he could put off the light, the water. If he put off the light, if he put off the light, it means uh, all kinds of energy, you know, the entire economy of that region is uh, uh, halts. Uh, uh, and therefore, there is no economy in that in that region. So, my idea was then that somebody has to learn how to copy him, how to copy him and uh, respond uh, in a similar way. I, I believe that uh, the OLA, the Oromo Liberation Front, is in a in a unique position uh, to do that kind of thing uh, to Addis Ababa. For example, uh, the, the thing that we mentioned is there. Huh? Uh, was how the entire uh, power system in Ethiopia is made up of the GERD system. It's a, a transmission uh, line of, made up of thousands of poles that crisscross the entire country, precisely because Ethiopia gets its energy from hydro plants only, from hydro, or from hydro dams only. That means that, especially since the, most of this uh, uh, GERD system is, most of these hydro dams are in the southern part of Ethiopia and in the western part of Ethiopia. Huh? Any cutting that is being done in between will literally stop the entire action in Addis Ababa. 
it was not possible before because there was no concerted force like the forces that are taking place right now. But right now, if something like that happens, it would cut off the human cost that is taking place. You know, every day, thousands of people are dying on both sides, you know. Eh? And it would bring uh, Addis Ababa to its knees. So I am hoping that somebody will get uh, this message. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yosef. Uh, and talking about that, uh, the uh, using hunger as a weapon and uh, how that is uh, making the whole war the most brutal right now in the world, the PBS uh, said this today. Ethiopia has become one of the most brutal on earth, threatening the very existence of the state and the lives of millions. A major weapon in that war, hunger. But tonight, the... Yeah, uh, with that, um, uh, Faisal, your final word, please. Yes, uh, I think that uh, little show is a good con context for me. But let me just go back a little bit and say that I will not rehash the military aspect of TDF and how they succeeded or not succeed, because I think Sargon has not only startled, but uh, captured the attention of military strategists in the world, the way he managed the TDF work and the TDF war. I think whether they depend, whether they have a timing bomb, ticking bomb, I think so far TDF has shown I mean, impressive way to manage the war and get out of the blockade, which would end up in uh, dismantling the PP government in Addis Ababa. For me, I think the war is not only military. And this is, Abi, as you said, Abi had everything that an army wants. I think the European army was one of the most modernized armies, not to mention the size it has. The war is fought on the heels of people's want, people's anger, people's pain, people's ideology. I think Abi is defeated at two fronts. On the one hand, the hunger tools that he tried to use in order to finish up with the Tikrai people had an inadvertent impact on him, galvanized particular people to tell them that they have no other way but to fight their way out. That really cemented that society. The other area that he lost, which both of them are political, is that he could not master organizational power from his own base, the Oromo, the entire Cushitic people, simply because he came against the ideology that they had, that they considered to stay in the Ethiopian domain. So these two fronts really squeezed Abi to a point to use the word that was used here, to be choked in his own palace. The third factor, which was the Amara, who would have agreed with his, his ideology, was a temporary but not at heart alliance and that is being shattered in the last few weeks since he started talking about negotiation. Tikrai didn't have any other option except to just highlight some of the things that Getach already said today, that they don't have any other option but to do or die. And I think to die, they already passed that. It's now the to do part, which is to get rid of PP and establish or help with the help of Ola and other gurus, establish some format and forum where discussions as to what Ethiopia should be or should not be can be uh, negotiated and started. I think the last issue I'd like to just mention is that we have not seen the earthquake, political and military earthquake that the Oromo nation has in store for us. We have only seen bits and pieces of Ola and its movement. I think once Ola gets everything together, cements its relationship with TDF, which has started on a good note, 
there would be a political military earthquake that will shock Abi and his entourage to a point where an exit that is even more haphazard than the Mengistu haphazard uh, uh, we have seen with. And finally, Addis Ababa, what Addis Ababa would be? Just look at the demographics of Addis Ababa. 80% of Ethiopia's GDP is buried in Addis Ababa. 20% are dolled and distributed throughout the 150 of the 115 million, 110 million Ethiopians are scrapping for 20% of the GDP. If the upper middle class and middle class of Addis Ababa who have been siphoning the resources from the rest of Ethiopia want to just cause a bloodshed for the rest of one party and one person. I don't think they will make that decision. I think when they see the cloud is gathering and what we have now is the calm, I think they will go for what's good for their family and how to protect their family and let the military of the three sides, Ola, TDF, and Abi is dwindling army capacity face each other and see that. I don't expect a middle class who have three kids who goes who takes his kids to school, take up the gun and fight this moving earthquake of armies coming from the many sides that they are coming when it comes to Addis Ababa. So I don't expect that. I think we are seeing the closing chapter of this war. Thank you very much, Faisal and uh, Professor Eskel Yosef Gabriel. That was uh, very insightful. We are getting uh, live feedback from the audience. Uh, so uh, everyone is appreciating the input. Uh, yes, I think one of the things that we will be following maybe by when we meet next week would be the Mille Front. And uh, in Mille uh, last, uh, I think yesterday, the TDF reported the uh, uh, gunning down of the um, M35 or one of these My... uh, gunships. Uh, maybe that this is the footage they released today. <laughs> So this is the front, I think, uh, that would uh, maybe uh, force Abi into, uh, you know, a clear uh, sitting on the table and uh, maybe uh, decide what comes next. So thank you very much for your time and good night from here. And uh, I hope to see you all again Friday all this right. time next week. Okay, thank you. You have been following UMD Media's weekly Edge panel uh, with Professor Eskel, Yosef Gabrahewat, and Faisal Robla. And we'll uh, be coming back uh, the same time next week, uh, gauging what has happened uh, during the week and uh, what the outlook might look like. I would be signing off. Uh, before that, uh, I have a couple of ads for tomorrow in uh, Amharic and in Tigrinya. Uh, actually, this is an English uh, show tomorrow coming uh, with uh, Asafa Abai in English, Tagaru Disaster Relief Fund. This is a US-based uh, fund, and we'll be talking about their uh, Giving Tuesday event that's coming soon. And then Sabah uh, Sa'at Shudushta Eastern Time, Ms. Sanhid, Ms. Professor Daud Siraj, Abinda Gabrahewot, Abinda Gabrahewot, uh, thank you for following us please share subscribe and like so that many can access this material uh, this was your host, Gita Josepha. Bye for today.